Good morning and a warm welcome to our 11 o'clock service. Uh, people who have come in here and people who are watching us live, a very warm welcome to you. Let's start the service with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you, Lord, for bringing us one more time into your house. Lord, we thank and praise you for all that we, you have done in our lives over the last week. Thank you for bringing us in, Lord. We give you glory. Speak to our hearts, Father. Father, you know our, our burdens, our desires, our difficulties through which we have come. Father, Lord, we pray that you will take hold of our hand this morning and you will speak to us. As we sing and rejoice, let your name be glorified, Father. Give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Shall we stand and worship as the band leads us? In our first song, we stand and lift up our hands. We stand and lift up our hands, for the joy of the Lord is our strength. We bow down and worship Him now, our great and awesome is He, together we sing, everyone sing, holy is the Lord. The earth is filled with His glory Holy is the Lord, God Almighty The earth is filled with His glory The earth is filled with His glory We stand and lift up our hands For the joy of the Lord is our strength we bow down and worship Him now. How great, how awesome we sing. Together we sing. Everyone sing. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord. Together we sing, everyone sing. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. Holy is the Lord, God Almighty. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. The earth is filled with His glory. Amen. Would you like to be seated? I'm just going to do a quick focus for our young people and children. I had an amazing message on um, Facebook last night from one of my hundreds of cousins. Who here has got a cousin? Okay, who's got more than four cousins? Who's got more than 10 cousins? Who's got 35 cousins? I've got loads, and that's because I'm old. Because <laughs> my cousins' children are my cousins, and their children are my cousins. Anyway, one of my first cousins twice removed, amazing news on Facebook. She is, I think she's 16, 15 or 16. And she has just beaten the senior British judo champion in under adult age and she's a junior just beaten the top one so she's not only a british judo 
um, number one, she's also beaten, for junior, she's also beaten a senior. Now, why am I saying that? I suppose I partly feel quite proud of her. And also, I want you to know that I know somebody who's brilliant at something. Okay. Do you ever do that? If you bump into somebody you know who's quite well known to others, you say, oh, well, you know, guess who I saw yesterday? Or if you're at school or college, you want to be in with the in crowd? When I was a little girl at primary school at Woodside, there used to be this thing where you went around the playground. So I was about five or six, all right? If you can imagine that far back. You go around in the playground, and you'd have your arm, three or four of you, girls often, but boys would do it too, arms around each other. You're going around it as a, a, a line of four people, going, who wants to play? And you might say, in those days, we used to play fairies and witches. <laughs> we used to go around the playground and say, who wants to play? And any children who wanted to play that game would go and join on the end of the line who's walking around the playground saying that. And here's Barbara. <laughs> Are you expecting to do this, Barbara? Yes. yes. OK. Let me just finish my story then. The point being that you actually people wanted to be seen with people who were really seen as the best. We wanted to be with the people who would give us what we call kudos. And now Barbara's going to come and take over. Thank you very much indeed. Pardon me for my tardiness. Today, my, um, the children's focus is based on uh, today's reading of Mark 10, 35 to 45. So let's pretend we are in school. First, the teacher is late, and she comes in front of the class and asks a question which you don't understand. What would you do? Anybody? What would you do? So she teaches something you don't understand, she asks a question you don't understand, what would you do? You will ask her a question. That's good. You would ask for some help to better understand what's being taught and what is really, and, and that is a really smart thing to do. Now, would the teacher be very, the teacher would be very unhelpful if they always say, no, you cannot ask a question. I know some do that. Or, I'm not answering that question. And sometimes the trick is, they don't know the answer, so they would say, what do you think? A teacher who won't let you ask questions at any point about what you are being taught isn't doing everything they can do to help you learn. So in today's reading from Mark, we see two of Jesus' students, disciples, James and John, ask their teacher, Jesus, a question. They asked him if they could be his favorite disciples. You know, when you're in school and you want to be teacher's pet. And what is important to note is how Jesus responds to their question. First, he doesn't get mad at his students for asking him this question. And second, he answers their question even if their question probably wasn't what Jesus wanted them to be thinking about. He tells them that they are asking a difficult thing and that ultimately it is not him who decides who is the best student. It is God who decides that. That sounds like a good answer. But, in, but it turns out that other disciples get upset with James and John for trying to be the favorite disciples just by asking. Jesus, though, tells the other disciples it's not good to try and stop people from asking questions. He tells them this by saying, 
whoever wishes to become a great teacher among you must be your servant. So how can we be a servant to others like Jesus wants us to be? In serving others, we demonstrate love for God. Our love for God will be expressed in our love for others. I suppose we can serve by being patient with the people around us, listening attentively and effectively, giving up ourselves to help others, just like Jesus has done for us. As they say, true leadership is servanthood, and the greatest leader of all time is in the example of Jesus Christ. And that's the good news today. Let us pray. Dear God, help us to mean it when we say, I wish I could be more like Jesus. Please show us each day how to become a greater servant to those around us. Let us see the people around us. Let us know the people around us. Let us listen to them. Let us answer their questions. Let us help them. And let us be a friend like you are to us. This we ask in the blessed name of your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Barbara. We come to a very important time, a time where we come to God to say sorry. Shall we all in an attitude of prayer look up to God and just bring before us things that we have done in the past week that are not correct. Jesus says, repent for the kingdom of heaven is close at hand. So let us turn away from our sin and turn to Christ. Confessing our sin in penitence and faith, let us together confess our sin to him. Let's join together to say this prayer which has come up on the screen. Lord God, we have sinned against you. We have done evil in your sight. We are sorry and repent. Have mercy on us according to your love. Wash away our wrongdoing and cleanse us from our sin. Renew a right spirit within us and restore us to the joy of your salvation through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Let's stand and worship as the band leads us in our next song.
be seated. Isabella will bring us the reading, then followed by Regina who will bring us God's word today. first reading is taken from the book of Hebrews, reading from chapter 5, from verse 1 to 10. Every high priest chosen from among mortals is put in charge of things pertaining to God on their behalf, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with the ignorant and wayward since he himself is subject to weakness. And because of this, he must offer sacrifice for his own sins as well as for those of the people. And one does not presume to take this honor, but takes it only when called by God, just as Aaron was. So also Christ did not glorify himself in becoming a high priest, but was appointed by the one who said to him, You are my son, today I have begotten you. And he says also in another place, You are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears, to the one who was able to save him from death, and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered, and having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obeyed him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. The Gospel reading is taken from Mark chapter 10, reading from verse 35 to 45. James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came forward to him and said to him, Teacher, we want you to do for us whatever we ask of you. And he said to them, what is it you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Grant us to sit, one at your right hand and one at your left, in your glory. But Jesus said to them, You do not know what you are asking. 
Are you able to drink the cup that I drink or be baptized with the baptism that I am baptized with? They replied, we are able. Then Jesus said to them, the cup that I drink, you will drink. And with the baptism with which I am baptized, you will be baptized. But to sit at my right hand or at my left is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared. When the ten heard this, they began to be angry with James and John. So Jesus called them and said to them, You know that among the Gentiles, those whom they recognize as their rulers lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them. But it is not so among you. But whoever wishes to become great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be slave for, of all. For the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. Here ends the readings. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see you. As we come to look at God's word, shall we pray together? Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you love us. We thank you that you said where two or three are gathered, you are there in their midst. And we know that you are here with us. So we ask, Lord, that you would open our hearts, open our minds, so that we hear not human beings speaking, but we hear, each of us hear, what you are saying to us. Let your words not return to you void, but let them accomplish that which you purpose in our lives for your glory. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, I don't know how many of you here do a lot of reading of, and uh, concentrate on the Old Testament. Um, I'm, I'm aware of some people, actually some Christians, who do not engage very much uh, with the Old Testament. Yet it is said that um, in the Old Testament are hidden all the treasures that are revealed uh, in the New Testament. In the Old Testament, therefore, has a lot of treasure uh, that really becomes revealed in its fullness uh, in the New Testament. Now, those who disregard uh, the Old Testament are really depriving themselves of uh, uh, great treasure. Uh, indeed, they are depriving themselves of the fullness of God's word. It is in the Old Testament that we have a lot of uh, prophecies, which uh, many of which uh, uh, have already been fulfilled as we look at the Old, New Testament. And the Old Testament points us uh, to the coming uh, of, of Jesus, the promised redeemer, uh, the suffering servant. The story of Abraham sacrificing his son Isaac on Mount Moriah is just one example uh, which shows us a foreshadowing of Christ, uh, God's only son uh, who would be sacrificed uh, for, for our sins on the wooden cross. Uh, the New Testament Gospels reveal the promised Messiah, the Christ, in the person of Jesus of Nazareth. So the coming of Jesus didn't do away with the Old Testament. Rather, uh, Jesus came to fulfill it. It's no wonder then that uh, as he began his earthly ministry, Jesus' uh, mission statement came straight from uh, the book of the prophet Isaiah. And it read, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has appointed me, anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for captives and release for the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. It was uh, the same prophet Isaiah who prophesied of the coming of the servant king, the suffering servant 
who we had read also in the Gospel of Mark, as uh, Isabella read. And uh, in uh, Prophet Isaiah's book, it reads, he was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain. He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. It's in the Old Testament where we come across the system of uh, the priesthood. Uh, the high priest was a very important person. He had a very important role uh, to play as mediator between uh, people and uh, their holy God. The word priest comes from the Hebrew word meaning to draw near. The priest's role was to uh, speak uh, to God on behalf of the people and to be God's mouthpiece to the people. The Israelites as sinners, as we all are, could not approach their holy God of themselves. They needed a high priest to be their mediator who would reconcile them to God, one who would draw near to the infinitely holy God. So we hear from the Hebrew reading that uh, uh, Isabella just read. Every high priest is selected from among the people and is appointed to represent the people in matters related to God, to offer gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray, since he himself is subject to weakness. This is why he has to offer sacrifices for his own sins, as well as for the sins of the people. And no one takes this honor on himself, but receives it when called by God, as Aaron was. In order to assume the priestly role, the high priest was consecrated at a very special service uh, uh, where a ram without blemish uh, was killed and the whole of it burned uh, as an offering to the Lord, which indicating the total dedication of the high priest to God's work. Only after that very special ceremony was the high priest then ready to take on his role as mediator between people and their God. Once a year, the high priest performed the atoning sacrifice and of burnt offering on the great day of atonement, entering the Holy of Holies, where no other person could enter. He was able to enter the Holy of Holies with the blood of the sacrifice. So then we have the New Testament, and Jesus enters as our high priest. As we heard again in Hebrews, in the same way, Christ did not take on himself the glory of becoming a high priest. But God said to him, You are my son. Today I have become your father. And he says in another place, You are a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Jesus was appointed by God as our high priest. By the shedding of his blood on the cross, he becomes not just our high priest, but he becomes the ultimate spotless sacrificial lamb of God, opening for us the way into the Holy of Holies, the very presence of God. No wonder then he is called a priest forever in the order of Melchizedek. Melchizedek was a king and priest of Salem, now Jerusalem, he is described as one having neither a beginning nor end of life. He was likened to Jesus, who is eternal. This tells us the supremacy of the high priestly role of Jesus. So Jesus, as a lamb of God, died once for all, and he forever lives to make intercessions for you and for me. As Brian said last week, uh, this great high priest who is Jesus came as fully God and fully human. He is able to identify with our weaknesses. He understands the challenges that we face. He has empathy and compassion because he understands us. We can approach God, we can approach him with confidence 
knowing that he is one of us. He is one with us. No angel could serve as high priest, for no angel could understand humanity, our weaknesses, and deal gently with those who are ignorant or going astray. It takes another human being to be aware of human weakness and to be sensitive to humanity's needs and be able to represent humanity before God. So it is that Jesus, as fully God and fully human, came to know the anguish, the pain, and the suffering of being vulnerable. When I first discovered this passage of Hebrews, I was just awestruck. When I began to read Hebrews, I discovered that I have a high priest, Jesus. To know that when I couldn't pray, and there were times when I couldn't, and there's still times when I can't pray, I can't find words, I simply sit at my place of prayer and know that Jesus understands my pain. He understands my anguish. He understands my weakness. And he prays for me. That changed the game for me. It was a total game changer the time I discovered that, when I first discovered that. And then I discovered as well that this Jesus prayed for me, for you and me. But it was then I read again and again that passage in John 17 where Jesus, the Son of God, before leaving earth, was praying. Not, that for the, not just for the disciples then, but he was praying for the ones who would believe after them, for you and me. I read those words. I read those words, and I was just awestruck. It changed everything from, for me, for the way I faced life, for the way I faced challenges and difficulties. I know that Jesus stands as my intercessor even when I can't pray. Jesus came down from heaven and to live among us. He was tempted like us, but he never succumbed to sin. He became then the spotless, spotless, sacrificial lamb of God. So he came both as high priest and as atoning sacrifice for my sins and your sins. Jesus did what no other high priest could do. He provided for us eternal life by his sacrificial death on the cross. Yes, Jesus, who God appointed to represent us as high priest, is also the source of our salvation. And we have, because of him, we have the hope of eternal life. Unlike the annual offering that had to be made on the Day of Atonement, this one Paschal Lamb of God, Jesus, died once for all. That is the kind of sacrifice that you and I have in Jesus. Because of his death and resurrection, we have an assured future. You and I have this hope of eternal life. The world with all its struggles, its pains, and its challenges is not all that there is. We have a glorious future to look forward to in the presence of our Heavenly Father. This world and its pursuit of fame, power, money, and luxuries is not all that there is. God has a better future. Yet many people, many people, spend their lives in vain pursuit of these things, of pleasure, of fame, of power, of glory. That is the way of the world. Not so, says Jesus to the two disciples, as we heard Isabella read from the Gospel of Mark. These two disciples had asked for power and glory one to sit on Jesus' left and one on the, on the right. They had their minds on earthly things. They had their minds on power, on fame, on influence. 
Their thinking could not have been further from their masters. His talk of suffering, crucifixion, and death seemed to have fallen on deaf ears. Jesus' way of greatness was different from the world's. Here we have two of his closest disciples who had spent nearly three and a half years living with Jesus day after day. Yet, they come up with one of the most incredulous requests of all. Now, as if to drive the point home, Mark, the writer, brings the requests of these two disciples soon after Jesus had just spoken to them for the third time about his coming, betrayal, suffering, and death on the cross. James and John show us the extent of their total disengagement with what Jesus was saying about the purpose of his coming, indeed, about the sort of kingdom that he was ushering in. James and John see Jesus' journey towards Jerusalem as a journey to power, where Jesus would overthrow the authorities. And these two would sit one on his left and one on his right. Because as then, and probably is still now to some extent, physical proximity to the person in authority guarantees you power. Of course, there's nothing wrong in being ambitious. But really, our ambition should be focused, based on Jesus, not for our own glory, as these two were. These two brothers had their minds on earthly things, not on things of God. For Jesus was ushering in a different sort of kingdom, quite unlike the kingdoms of this world. In God's kingdom, power lay in the one who was serving James say, Jesus said in, uh, in the passage we've just heard, whoever wants to be great in his kingdom must be prepared to be servant of all. Here we have a servant king as prophesied by Isaiah. He came as a baby. He was born in a manger and yet the savior of the world. He is the one who, though he was equal with God, did not appoint himself, but was appointed by God the Father to be our high priest. This is the one, though he was equal with God, was obedient to God the Father and was obedient to death, even the death of the cross. This Jesus is the one who offered reverent submission to the Father's will. That is the way power manifests itself in the kingdom of God. Through humility, submission, and service. As we heard from the song earlier from the band, our God is the God of the humble. Our God is God of the weak, the broken. That is the God we serve. That is the way to power in his kingdom. Now Mark seems to want us to see these two disciples as they really are. Mere ordinary human beings like you and me with all our flaws, with all their flaws. Yet Jesus chose to work with them. And Jesus still chooses to work with people who are like us. Despite ourselves, Jesus chooses to work with broken vessels like us. He transformed the world with 12 ordinary men. And nothing is beyond his power to transform the world today through broken vessels like you and me showing that it's not us, but his power at work in us that accomplishes all. All we need to do is to offer ourselves and to be open to say, Lord, here I am. Use me as you would. 
and God does mighty wonders with people who are broken. I find that a great comfort. I do not have to strive. I know that God will take the broken vessel like I am and use me as he does. And I'm grateful for that. And each of us needs to look at ourselves and not be afraid to open ourselves to God, to take on the different ministries that we have in this church and say, here I am. God does work through broken vessels. He works through our weaknesses and he accomplishes great things for his kingdom, for his glory. We follow in the way of the servant king who came in humility. He laid down his life as the ultimate sacrifice for our redemption. He rose victorious and is exalted at the right hand of God as our great high priest who forever lives to intercede for you and for me. We needn't worry when we can't pray, when we can't find words. All we need to do is to come into his presence. James and John may not have known the, the full implications of their accepting the cup, meaning the suffering that Jesus was going to go through. But we have the scriptures, and we have the apostles, and we have a slightly clearer picture of what that entails. And that gives us huge privileges, and with that, huge responsibilities to share the good news of Jesus' sacrificial death on the cross. Like our Lord Jesus, we need to live out the kingdom way of greatness. It's not about self-promotion, self-importance, or self-interest. It's about serving God, serving the other. We are called to be Christ's hands, to be his feet, his eyes and his ears, spreading the news of the hope that we find in the death and resurrection of our servant king, Jesus of Nazareth. He is the God of humility. He is the God of the humble. He is the God of the broken, the weak. He is the servant king. That is the way to greatness in his kingdom. Now may God help us to live the way of the kingdom in a world whose hunger for power and greatness and influence is only demonstrated by loading, over, loading it over on the weak, the poor, the broken, and the vulnerable. Amen. Thank you, Regina. Let's in an attitude of prayer, think about what has been spoken to us. Very powerful words. He not only became the high priest for us, but also he became the spotless lamp of God. We have a high priest who you and I, whenever we cannot pray, we can come and sit in his presence because he prays for you and me. He understands our pain. He is our high priest and also the source of our salvation. In his death and resurrection, we have a glorious future to look forward to.
Father, thank you, Lord, for being our high priest who understands our pain. When the world looks at power and glory, you seek after the humble, the broken, and the bruised. so that you can help them enter into your eternal glory, Lord, eternal joy. Father, we thank you. Help us to trust in you as a high priest. Help us to come to you as our high priest and just to sit still in your presence when we are not able to do anything. Just give us up, our, give us up to you, Lord, completely and just sit still that you will fight for us. You will pray on our behalf. You will intercede. As we continue to be in an attitude of prayer, Regina will bring us our intercessions. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your presence here with us. We thank you that you are touching each one of us here. We thank you that you are ministering to us by the power of your spirit. We give you thanks for your word. And we pray, Lord, for all the churches across this land, as your spirit rises on each church spire, may there be that light. Each church be a beacon of light across this land and we can see a movement of your Holy Spirit transforming this land, healing this land. We pray, Lord, that we will see revival across our land. Not just in this land, but indeed across your worldwide church. We pray for your church. That you would raise up the banner of Christ, our servant king. And that the message of hope will go across the world. And our persecuted brothers and sisters will see that movement of your spirit and be encouraged as they see transformation happening across your world. Thank you for those who are spreading your word across the world. Thank you for those who support our persecuted brothers and sisters. We thank you for the movement of your spirit, Lord. We pray, Lord, for those who are suffering poverty, those who are suffering in areas of conflict. Lord, we pray that you would step in and bring them your hope. And Lord, equip those who are supporting them, Lord, the relief agencies, that they would be able to bring them some hope. Lord, we pray for the victims of injustice across the world in all its many shapes. Lord, we pray that the governments of the nations would rule in ways of justice and peace. We pray for our leaders as they prepare to meet to discuss the issues of your environment. Lord, we pray that we would see changes, changes for the good of the environment. Lord, give them wisdom, give them determination, let there be unity and purpose for this cause. 
we bring before you our government here. We ask them, Lord, that you give them wisdom in the governance of this nation, the economics of this nation, the health of this nation. Lord, give them your wisdom, divine wisdom, especially as we approach winter with the virus spreading. We pray, Lord, that you would curb the spread of this virus, but also you will give the resources required, the government, the health service, that they need to be able to provide the health care that is needed. Father, we pray for our government and those in positions authority, of authority. We remember particularly this morning, Lord, the death of one of the MPs, Lord, Sir David Eames. Lord, we pray. We pray, Lord, that for the family, that you would embrace them and surround them with your love, your comfort. And we pray that our government will find ways of protecting those in authority. And that, Lord, you would give them wisdom in this regard. We thank you, Lord, for our church family here at St. Mary's. We thank you for the many ministries that go on here, and we thank you for the messy church that is happening this afternoon. We pray for those who are coming, Lord, that you'd stay more people's hearts to come. Thank you for those who are preparing, Lord, to lead this service, that, Lord, you would just anoint them with your Holy Spirit. We thank you, Lord, for the work that has begun in our toilets. And Lord, thank you for that already significant uh, progress has been made. And we continue to pray that this remains so. We pray, Lord, that uh, you will lead and guide and that this will be on course. And we pray, Father, that you provide us with the resources that we need. Lord, stir people's hearts to be generous, to give towards your work, certainly for this building, Lord and all the things that we need, the projects that we have, the lighting, the building as it's going on, the kitchen. Lord, we just pray that you would stir many people's hearts to give generously to your work. For we want this place, Lord, to be a place where um, the community around can come and find, um, meet with you in many different ways. Lord, we just see a, 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 in a bubble of activity going on, and we just pray that you anoint this and you lead us in this regard. We pray for our vicar, Amanda, Lord, as she leads us, that you give her your wisdom, your guidance, and your protection. We pray for those of our church family who was not well, Lord, that they would know your healing touch. In a moment of silence, we bring before you those known to us who need your touch today. Thank you, Lord, that you are a God who is not bound by time or space, and that right now you are stretching out your hand and touching these on our minds, on our hearts. May they know your comfort, your peace, your healing grace. Father, as we move into this new week, we pray that we would move with you leading us, that we would go out and know what it is or how to live as you would have us, to show how we can be your hands, your feet, how to bind the brokenhearted. Let us know, O oh God, your presence with us. Whatever challenges we face, let us know that you are with us and you never leave us to face our perils alone. Bless us, Lord, for in Jesus' mighty name we pray. Amen. stand and worship us. The band leads us in our song. Father of kindness, you have 
darkness, you have filled me with peace. Giver of mercy, you're my help in time of need. Lord, I can't help but sing. Faithful you are. Savior, you have brought me here. You pulled me from the ashes. You have broken every curse. Blessed Redeemer, you have set this captive free. Lord, I can't help but sing. for praying for John, our builder. He's done the most amazing job over the last five days of last week. He's completely gutted the men's toilet section and got two um, new toilets, uh, actually, the actual sort of walls and partitions in place, which is really good, and a new sink. So he's going at a great pace. The preschool have been working really well with him, so on days when it's going to be particularly noisy, he's able to tell them each day when that's going to be. And because we've had good weather, the children have been, to be, been able to be outside in the garden. So continue to pray for John. He's doing an amazing job at the moment. And um, continue to pray for pray, play, pray, oh, sorry, preschool and uh, Amanda working in the office uh, so that uh, the noisy times can coincide with them not needing peace and quiet at that moment. Um, it, it does look like he'll me meet his target of being complete in six weeks. So um, that's really good to give thanks for. But continue to pray that the uh, days ahead are um, problem-free. Now, in two weeks' time, it's Missions Gift Sunday. And in this church, the way in which we apportion from our church giving uh, that which we give to other mission work elsewhere is to ask for a separate gift offering on, that, on a particular Sunday in the year. There are six societies or agencies whom we support. They are 
tier fund, who you've heard a lot about, I'm sure, over the years, who work in partnership with other communities overseas in order to provide better um, living circumstances. Then there's CMS, the Church Missionary Society, who do work in community in terms of teaching and in terms of sharing the word. We support someone called Pedro in Jaffa, which is in Israel, just south of Tel Aviv. He works for um, the church's mission amongst Jewish people. In Israel, it's called ITAC, the Israeli Trust of the Anglican Church. And I, I worked with them for four years. I worked in Jerusalem, however. Pedro has direct support from us for his ministry. He's in charge of a place called Bet Emmanuel. Bet meaning the house of, so the house of um, Jesus, one who came to be with us. It's a, a guest house. It's also a place of worship. And it's also a place of teaching. And he runs all kinds of community events to enable people to hear more about who Jesus the Messiah is. We also support um, the church army, and in particular the work of church, church army pastor in, on the Kidbrook estate, not so far from here, where there was quite a lot of serious um, uh, cases being uh, on television there. I think there had been a, a knifing on the Kidbrook estate that hit our headlines not very long ago. And we work, so we work, we uh, support work in this country as well as abroad as well. We also support Open Doors, and you might remember about four years ago, I went to, uh, three years ago, I went to Egypt with Open Doors in order to see the work they're doing with the persecuted church up the Nile, so in southern Egypt, and was really impressed with that work. And then slightly longer ago, about six or seven years ago, I went with the Bible Society to see their work in China. The Bible Society is our sixth society. In China, I went to visit churches that had also been persecuted. We went to take Bibles to them. The Bible Society has the most enormous printing press called Amity, which is in, uh, uh, which is in China. And they produce millions of Bibles that are sold around the world there. And indeed, I met Bible Society workers in Egypt when I was on the Open Doors trip there. They were working together to support the persecuted church. So that's just a touch of a sort of overall picture, if you like, of the kind of mission, the kind of work we are supporting by our giving. So we ask you on the 31st to support the mission of this church family because we're all part of it by making a pledge or making a donation on that day or a pledge to make a donation. Now, way back in the past, we were, that pledge would reach up to seven and a half, eight thousand pounds on that Sunday, which was good. It meant we could support each mission society really well indeed. That's been lowered over the years due to people not being here or incomes changing. But we do ask you to think very seriously. It's not just a question of us saying, could you just put 10 pounds extra in the offering? It's to ask for a, a commitment that you may be able to make this year that enables us to give a good, uh, a good amount of money to each society. Next Sunday, you should receive an envelope with all the information in it about our societies and also about how to make your pledge, how to make that offering on that day. In relation to giving, we've got a basket here on the communion table. If you want to make, if you normally make your offering by putting it in a basket in the past where you would pass it around, would you do that as we come to the end of our service? Just pop it in the basket here. So I think that's all I need to emphasize at the moment. We're going to come to our blessing now, and then we're going to have that lovely blessing song to send us on our way. Oh, no, I should just say, sorry, next Sunday. We are hoping by next Sunday to have some of the church rearranged so that we can offer different types of seating. All the seating on this side, which is the north side of the church, so the seats Regina uh, is sitting in and behind and all over here, will remain exactly as they are for people who quite rightly want to remain at a distance. And then the seating on the south side, so where all of you are, <laughs> will be put uh, back into the positions we had before COVID for those who feel safe and want to sit closer together. We will retain the one-way system through the church so that those who wish to remain at a distance don't suddenly find themselves caught up with people going backwards and forwards in the church. 
We are hoping to be able to offer refreshments in our, in our cafe area, which will be run as cafes are run um, out, out, out in the big wide world. And if you want to stay for refreshments, that's um, an offer that we can open to people next Sunday. You will be on tables where you sit just in twos, threes, fours, or no more than six around the table. And uh, your coffee and tea will be brought to you. We won't be offering any food refreshments at that point. So we come to the blessing now. Father, we thank you for your word to us. Thank you for your Holy Spirit drawing us into your presence. Thank you for your peace. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he lift up his face to shine upon you. May he lift up his countenance and give you his peace. Amen. The Lord bless you and keep you. Make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. Amen. Amen. And your family and your children and their children and their children. May his presence go before you and behind you and beside you, all around you and within you.